I would like to now invite uh, Shailaja from Jeevit Nadi. Um, so, uh, for people who don't know Shailaja here, she's uh, involved with a number of things, but she's been leading this effort on the rivers of Pune. And I read the abstract, I think it's very interesting. Uh, and without any further, uh, you know, introduction as such. Good morning, everyone. I'm audible, I believe. <laughs> I, my name is Shailaja Deshpande. I represent an organization, Jeevit Nadi. The full name is Jeevit Nadi Living River Foundation. It's an NGO working basically and currently on the urban rivers, though we are connected with other rivers along uh, across Maharashtra, not outside Maharashtra. But uh, we have been so far managing or trying to facilitate the people to come towards the river. Because we very frankly feel, unless and until there is a people's participation, no revival of any, any ecosystem can happen. And whatever Pankaj sir said or uh, Divyanshu said, Divyanshu knows us, he has been associated with Jeevit Nadi also. But whenever I heard, I heard your all uh, data and the information which you gave, Probably for us, citizen science was a side effect. When we started this uh, organization, it never had in our mind that we are going to work for citizen science, collecting data, documenting. But we knew for sure, a uh, bunch of us, when we started this group, about 20 to 20 of us, we decided that we want to work on revival of the rivers in Pune city itself. When we started, we were the alumni of Ecological Society who actually holds an um, inclusive diploma for the sustainable management of natural resources. We just had a basic information of a river ecosystem. We didn't have any information how to go about it, how to do. But the basic approach simply was if we have to revive the rivers, we have to bring in the people. And that's why all these programs started. We started uh, different awareness programs, events by the river. I just came from morning from one of the events which we had it at uh, Ram and Mura Confluence, which is Satsang. Uh, we are, uh, people are organizing and having a festival for Kabir, Sant Kabir. Now, how cultural things also can get connected is an interesting thing which one has to go through. So then, river curriculum in the um, colleges, schools, everywhere, how simplify the curriculum part of a river ecosystem. That is what we started. Then river walk and nature walk where Priyadarshini is part of because she has brought into the curriculum also for the symbiosis uh, liberal studies. And there are a lot of architectural colleges now. They have taken it as a part of curriculum. Of course, water quality. I will go uh, as in how we progress. Rather, I am going to share the journey, how we started this. When we started this, we realized that it has to have an approach and outreach to the people by doing all these programs. So we started a lot of these activities. There was spring mapping, natural springs which were running to the river, bringing children. Then there were toxic free lifestyle session. So how you start your cleaning the river right from your own home. So the wastewater is uh, managed. These type of sessions we started, then bringing children, telling them stories, bird walks, nature walks, biodiversity walks, most of the walks and then have an event once a year on India River Week throughout so that the people get connected throughout the year, uh, understanding the river and bringing the people to the river and whatever scientifically has been proved. But unless and until there is an emotional connect to any river ecosystem, I feel uh, it's uh, we can't do much about it. People have to be connected with the river. And then while doing this journey, we realized we need to have whatever is there. It has to go towards the solution providing. Unless and until there is a solution providing, uh, we are not going to revive or restore or conserve or protect our river ecosystems. So how do you go about it? And this was a hard experience which we have had that unless and until there is a bottom to top approach, top to bottom approach and people like us who are horizontally somewhere there. 
So understanding and sharing this river rejuvenation, which will have obviously the physical properties, the chemical properties, the biological properties, limnology, and the human impacts, unless and until we data document all these things together, because any ecosystem has, particularly when we are working on the river, we realize that it's a multi-level, multi-directional and multi-dimensional too. So how do you go about it? So we started again, as Pankajji has already mentioned, so I will not repeat all the things, but then connecting with the data which was available there. But it was very difficult because most of the data or the information or the researches which are there are usually not into the open source. So connecting with the organizations like Aquara or uh, geospatial means Dr. Shikan Gabari who does a lot of work on the morphology and then associating with the livelihoods of the people because we are also connected with the fishermen community which if you see in the last uh, uh, photo, there is a blue bag which is there. Now the fishermen catch early morning the fish catch. They do not have fridge or any system at home. Their livelihood depends on them. So this is an in-stream spring which actually keeps their bags intact till they have their sale in the market in the evening. So sir, making this spring, you know, protect this, conserve this, even if it is a micro level, how do you go about it? Unless or until you have a data or you have a proper research or established what is the influence zone of that discharge area. So obviously then slowly we started realizing, yes, data, documentation, there needs to be proofs of floods, the droughts and everything. Understanding the ecosystem, watershed, groundwater facts, water quality facts and then create a link between the academia and the common people. Obviously, when it is a river, it's a unidirectional. So from source to confluence, we have not gone to the seas yet, but source and floodplains, unless and until we understand all these things, it's not going to be possible. So what we are doing right now? We started a vertical program which is called as Adopt a Stretch. Every weekend, people closer, geographically closer to their areas, they adopt that stretch. They start taking care of this stretch. Data, document, document what? We have a lot of temples. Culturally, every city is rich and a lot of organic content in form of Nirmalya comes. Now, when I say ki we have to go towards the solution providing, can we start doing Nirmalya composting into the temples? So the awareness among the local stakeholders, the primary stakeholders which started happening. Then there is a, as I said that I came from the confluence just now, where it's a proper riparian zone, it's a pristine ecosystem. But Unfortunately, in urban areas, I find a total lack of any documentation as a research data of establishing a riparian zone and the importance of it. It's totally lacking everywhere. So if you data, if you compile the data, what are the perennial wetlands stand for? What is the um, biodiversity over there? We started documenting all this. Aditi is not here, Piyush. But I'll just take her slide where, again, as I said, that unless until you go towards the solution, people are not going to get connected with it. So this is a wetland which is which happened at one of the stretches where a sewage line was getting connected with a live spring. So with the help of wetlands, creating the retention times, using the same plants over there, this experiment was done by the local citizens. We monitored the previous uh, water quality, later water quality. Now the live spring is going straight away to the river and the water coming from the sewage is getting into the uh, river after treatment. The, the most important thing, the common citizens have a feel good factor that they are doing something for the river. When you see today's state, everybody feels at loss that it's a humongous task how one can do. 
So these are small bit of things we started doing, and then we started mapping the uh, uh, discharge areas as well as we are also doing the recharge areas of the aquifers along with aqua dam, and then correlating why the perennial wetlands when the rivers are in the base flows, what exactly is happening in all seasonality. So we started mapping all this. Then the importance, as I said, that there is a huge lack of any established data about the riparian zones. There is a lot you can find on the mangroves, but the riparian zones and the associated diversity and the biodiversity is hardly not there. Then we started ma mapping these traces because one of the uh, area has started the la change in land use always happens in urban areas. So if you lose the forest, what happens? So this is again done by the citizens. Probably this could not be a very scientific thing, but what we did was from 2017, we started mapping these changes in the built up land, fallow land. And the same fallow land, you can see the increase by just because when we started working on that, we started protecting. So what we did that we had mapped the flora before, and then we realized that there is an increase in the di diversity of the floral species and all are native which are coming there. And then habitat mapping, of course. And associated biodiversity along with the habitat, which birds, which uh, insects, which butterflies actually are using which plants and what exactly is impacting there in the overall ecosystem. So now currently we have mapped almost more than 18 stretches all throughout the season where we have mapped all the eco-sensitive areas in all seasons in urban areas. And most importantly, we have also mapped the stresses because unless and until you reduce the stresses, you cannot increase the potential of the ecosystems. And then connecting with the cultural significances. water quality. Again, um, Dr. Moghe came to our rescue for uh, giving this uh, impacts of pol pollutants and how the life cycle analysis of each and every uh, product which we use on, in the common areas, yes, can be used. So this is again few things which I'm quickly running through that we started doing life cycle analysis of water hyacinth creating public pressure. That is the most important thing currently we are doing. Unless until this happens, probably you may call it as an activism, but now people have started understanding the importance of the ecosystem. And probably this is the outcome of it that current riverfront development, which has been proposed in Pune city, is been largely getting opposed by the local Pune because Pune wants the natural, clean and polluted free rivers. So these are our learnings. Of course, whatever uh, Pankaj sir has said, I have already uh, put it, almost it's the same thing which uh, we have learned through our learnings. And this is what we have uh, continued doing. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. So I see a huge scope for you interacting strongly with the rain gauge and uh, rain monitoring teams also because whatever yes. water quality and river flow, everything will be well connected with that. So the yes. data of the river, river level, river quality, everything will be well connected with the weather changes as well. So yes. I see that as a good scope. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. In case anybody else, otherwise I have a question. Yeah. So. Um, you talked about this being a slightly tough journey from where you started, yes. uh, including the fact that data is not available. Uh, now, Pune, of course, has a very rich history of uh, education institutions, scientific institutions. And I would think that there is a fair bit of data that has been collected over a historical time scale. Yeah. How uh, difficult has it been for you as a citizen group or as a citizen to access this data? And where did you find the openings if you did? Uh, 
one thing I'm finding it difficult that it's very difficult to get the research data because it's not in the open source. What we wish to have that everything should come in the open source so that we can have a reference base. What we had when we started was uh, two papers by our own sir, uh, sir who did, which was in 1980s and uh, Vartak sir from Agarka Research Institute, which is in 1958 for the flora. Nothing is there in between. How do you have a base reference based data when you want to build up the things uh, about compiling the documentation? And this is what is the maximum difficulty which we face everywhere. And connecting with the students, college students and university students, we tried. But usually what happens, they go by the project. We go by the holistic uh, uh, purpose because ultimately whatever we collect the data or document has to go towards the solution of the current issue, which is not happening when you have the students. These are the two problems which we face. Yeah. Sorry for <laughs> budging again. No problem. Uh, I, I think I'm of the opinion that uh, publicly funded data should be in the public domain, yeah. including uh, all meteorological or water, groundwater, all kind of data should be available for public and research purposes. Yes. Yeah. And I think one of the outcome of this meeting should be that, uh, you know, a, I mean, we should uh, show clearly that uh, or ask the authorities that, okay, this data should be available in accessible format. Sometimes they put online, okay, yeah. but it may not be in access of accessible format or right. not all data is available there. Yeah, I think uh, that should be outcome that we force the, all the public agencies to provide the data and we show that this is absolutely necessary for us. Yeah. yeah? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, not a question, but sort of commenting on Shailaja's answer because I have one foot in the academics and one foot in the <laughs> social segment. Uh, what you said is very true that uh, students and professors seem to be driven by projects and unfortunately their projects are driven by what is being published in academic journals. Okay. And that is the reason why local data collection is never given never. importance. So I think that is one awareness raising that needs to happen in the academic institutions that uh, look at the local uh, situation. There are so many project ideas yes. here. Yes. Uh, we have done uh, vulnerability mapping at ward level using architecture students, but we don't get a lot of response for that. People exactly. are always looking for publications in foreign journals typically or looking for opportunities for going for uh, postgraduate studies abroad and therefore they feel that local based uh, publications or reports will not help them. So how do we break that barrier uh, is also a question that I think yes. we should consider. Yes. Is there any, uh, I'm Shreyas from ISAR, is there yes. any study uh, which deals with perception, public perception about how polluted the river is? I mean, because they don't look at river, they don't have any understanding. One example I can tell when we walk in front of IITM, there is one board which talks about pollution level today and what is acceptable level. Suppose that kind of board is there in, in major bridges, like near municipal yeah. bridge. Correct. And this is the, I mean, just to show that how bad it is. So is there any... Like uh, again, there is a problem about the water quality monitoring because that's one of the most expensive unless and until some research organization comes there, you know, to show that because whatever we have sort of a hand tools, you know, it is just to make the children or the students to understand what is the DO level. We do not go beyond that. But there are heavy metals, there are pesticides, runoffs, there are agri huge amount of agricultural runoffs, which are not shown on any of the websites and heavy metals testing is a huge, uh, it's an expense basically unless and until someone takes it along. It becomes very difficult how do you, what type of parameters will be portrayed on the board. 